Good evening. Good evening. We're grateful to have you here this evening at PCPC. Help us christen this new hall with some great music. Um, I'm Jay Marty Cope. I'm on the music staff here at the church, and may I give you a warm welcome. You're going to get a lot of warm welcome as the sun sets. We don't know quite how the sun plays in this room, so it'll probably change. If you have a bad seat, it'll probably change in five minutes, so move around as you need to, and you're welcome to sit on the couches if, you, if you'd like. Uh, if you don't mind uh, taking any electronic devices in your pocket that might be tempted to make noise and make sure they don't make noise, I think that would be great. Um, the concert series is generously supported by the Performing Arts Friends of Music and offerings that are taken. Uh, we're not going to pass an offering because of some of the COVID concerns, but there is a little offering box right here on this post. If you can put something in there if you like, or if, you, if you'd rather send in a check, you can send it um, to PCPC, Care of the Concert Series, or Daniel Tillman. Uh, if you send a check in, we'll make sure it gets to the right place. We thank those who have come before us, who have given generously, and we thank you for participating and joining in that as well. Um, we have, uh, we've just added one last event on our series this year. Some of you know that the Met Orchestra for the Metropolitan Opera in New York uh, went without pay for a very long time when COVID hit, and have just, they've just been renegotiating their contract to get some, some funds in their pocket. So they've been without work for a very long time. Uh, the Dallas Symphony conductor, Fabio, Fabio Luizzi, has had a great relationship with the Met Orchestra, knows a lot of those players, and wanted to do something for them. So he partnered with the president of the DSO, Kim Nolte, and they came up with this wonderful idea for an aid concert. And so they're bringing 50 Met musicians next weekend to Dallas. Southwest Airlines has gotten involved, Capital One, et cetera, to kind of sponsor this wonderful event as they play Mahler down at the Meyerson next weekend, May 1 and 2. As part of the visit and the residency of the Met Orchestra, they are going out into the city, into Dallas here, and they're going to present several chamber concerts of chamber music, which combines DSO musicians and Met musicians. And here at PCPC, we're very grateful to host one of these concerts. It's free. It's open to the public. There's no admission or ticket. It will be here in the sanctuary on Monday, May 3rd. So it's just a week from tomorrow. Monday, May 3rd. 7 o'clock here in the sanctuary. It's free. And it'll be chamber music with members of the Met Orchestra and the DSO. And we're grateful to participate in this opportunity to bless these musicians from New York who've been through quite a lot during this time. Jeremy has a couple CDs which will be available over here after the concert. They'll be $15 in cash. Um, if you can't pay cash, um, I think you can get them online or you can stay in touch with the music department office. We can make sure you get one. Otherwise, we're going to carry it in our bookstore downstairs later. Uh, but if you'd like a CD, they're $15. They're two CDs. They're available over here on the, on the bar platform, whatever that is. So uh, the bio uh, for Jeremy is in your program, and you'll see that he's done wonderful things and studied in wonderful places. Um, some of you wonder, like, how do we have a connection with Jeremy? Um, I used to do a lot of projects with his sister. And we did, worked at a studio up in Indianapolis, and there were <clears throat> five Collins brothers. Tracy was the only girl. And so uh, we, we would hang out and do recording projects. And some of the younger guys, Wes and uh, Zach and Jeremy, would come looking for change in the, in the couches at the studio. <laughs> and we'd, uh, we'd hide some quarters and things in the couch, and they'd come back and say they found these, this money in the couches. Anyway, they were just running around. Their, their father was a longtime trumpeter for the uh, uh, Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra. Philip Collins was 30 years, did all those wonderful recordings for Tellark and worked with Eric Kunzel and the Cincinnati Orchestra all those years. So I always considered it a privilege to hang out with the Collins, to go to Riverbend Orchestra Hall um, in um, uh, Cincinnati. Well, the youngest of the three brothers have done very, very well. Uh, Zach is in the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra as a violist. Uh, uh, Wes is the principal violist for the Cleveland Orchestra. And, of course, Jeremy's ripping up the world with all his fabulous guitar playing. Not just playing, but he's also written several compositions. You'll hear some tonight. Um, and guitarists all over the world are picking up his music and playing it. You can look on YouTube and see people attempting to play Jeremy's music. It's rather complicated. 
Just before he comes, let's, let's open in prayer. Lord, we're grateful for the gift of music. Thank you for the, the gifts of the arts, how we can see and hear and touch and feel. And these are gifts you give us, and we're grateful for them. Thank you for the way you've developed the gifts in Jeremy's life. Pray that you would use this time to bring us back to first things, the pleasures and joys of life which you bestow to us. We give you glory. Thank you for the joy you bring us. Uh, use this evening for these purposes, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please join me then in welcoming Jeremy Collins. Thank you, everybody. It's really great to be here, and I appreciate all of you taking the time out of your evening to come and listen to some guitar music. Um, that is a privilege and an honor that most of us musicians don't take for granted after the past year, and so I'm really just grateful to have the opportunity to play for you, so thank you for coming out. Um, I'm going to make a quick change to the program. As Jay Marty mentioned, um, um, I do like to compose. I want to share a little bit about some of the arrangements and compositions I'll play tonight. Um, I grew up starting the guitar around 12, 13, and I played all the traditional stuff that I heard on all the great Julian Bream, Segovia CDs. And I learned all this repertoire, and I was enjoying it. It was, it was awesome. And then I started to wonder, OK, is there more out there for the guitar? What has not been done? And I listened to some folk music and other kinds of guitar, and I noticed there were a lot of players altering the guitar tuning in other genres, but not as much in the classical guitar repertoire. So I got out my fingers and started tuning away, and I got to work, and I started trying to see what kind of music or chords or harmonies I could write that were, you know, not an E minor or G major or our four guitar keys, if you could make three or four. And what can we do that's different that would allow us to play things not so much based on what the limitations of the instrument are, but what the music wants to do. And so we'll talk about that more later as we get to some composers who very heavily were idiomatic in their sense of composition, meaning they used shapes and everything to find their, their chords. But I want to make a quick change. Um, I decided to change this this afternoon. I was actually, um, so there's a competition in Cleveland called the James Stroud Competition. And they asked me, the director last year, to write their set piece for the, um, all the finalists or semi-finalists. And so I got to work and I wrote this piece and I released it. And so the guy calls me today just to let me know, you know, the competition entrants are coming in. I said, hey, you know what, I've got this uh, concert tonight. I really would love to play the set piece. Do you care? And he goes, oh, no, I don't care at all. Go right ahead. So um, I'm going to take the liberty of playing this piece. It's called Reverie. And it's just a short three to four minute work, just kind of exploring beautiful harmonies. I think they're beautiful. And some chord shapes and keys that maybe you might not have heard from the traditional repertoire. So this is Reverie um, by yours truly.
Apologies. So as Jay Marty was talking about the story of going to the recording studio, I remember going there as a young kid and I was just so excited to just hear the music and just be in the studio, watch the players, and most importantly, just to have like a, a day trip to do something different than be in school. And I just set about, like I saw the vending machines there and they had all these wonderful treats. And of course I was like, I was just enamored by that. So the first thing I did, I was a young entrepreneur. I said, I'm gonna go look in the couches and see if I can find some quarters and change and then there's my snack money. So then I started looking around and I found some little bits. And after like, you know, hour of searching, I searched all the couches. I had enough to buy like a little pack of gum or something. <laughs> and so then I went to the studio and then Jay Marty goes, hey, come look in this couch over here. So I walk over and I look at the cushions. I look and there's like probably 15 or $20 worth of change. It had to have been that much. And I remember looking at it, I was like, is this where the rich people sit or something? Or like, why, how did I, how did I miss this? So anyway, he made my day and it took me about two or three minutes to realize, wait a minute, I think somebody put that there. <laughs> but um, it wasn't that bright. So I'm going to skip the first piece, which is Praise to the Lord Almighty. Um, that was a piece I played this morning in the service. Um, so I'm going to jump right to another arrangement, which is in a very similar tuning. Uh, this is Come Now, Fount of Every Blessing. Um, it's one of my all-time favorite hymns. And um, I'll mention that the program order tonight is not necessarily structured around what I think the best order should be, but more around what, with all these tunings, what takes the least amount of tuning time. So this is a hymn that I listened to a lot the last uh, year or two. Um, my wife and I had, uh, were lucky to have, uh, find out we were expecting newborn twins. And uh, they were born uh, 2019, right before Christmas. Uh, we found out right as we were expecting that they were a rare form of twins called mono-mono, which had a 50% survival rating, we were told. Um, God was good, and they were born, and they're happy and healthy, and um, they're one and a half years old. But this was a song I listened to a lot um, during that first year. Almost every drive to the hospital and back, because they were in the NICU for about three months, I had just, this was one of my favorite hymns to go to. So this is Come Now, Found of Every Blessing.
So this next piece is, again, another rather slow, dreamy piece. This piece is called Elegy. I wrote this in 2010. Um, it was my first slash second year of grad school. I was away from my parents, I'm away from my family, and I was just sitting and I went to school in LA at USC. And this piece was just kind of my reflections of being in California, um, just enjoying the, the beauty there. Also, just my first time having just a life away from Cincinnati, Ohio, where I'm from. And this piece has a lot of influences where I directly quote little instances. For example, there's a quote from a Brahms piano intermezzo. Um, there's a number of things you may recognize from, from different soundtracks or little snippets of things I like to intentionally put in there. But the piece is called Elegy. And an elegy is really just, I've never looked up the definition, but to my mind, it's a piece dwelling on eter eternal serious matters such as life and death. Um, and just our mortality as humans. And so this piece um, really just covers to me the, the joy of life, the sadness, the, the search for something more. Uh, so this is uh, my composition called Elegy. Thank you.
So finally, back to standard tuning. This is a piece by the Brazilian composer Heitor Villalobos. Um, he's well-known, well-liked in the classical guitar world. He's written preludes, etudes. His stuff is played pretty much by every player, either during their deve developmental years. Um, it's a frequent choice for competitors playing in competitions because his music is very guitaristic, but has a lot of, um, let's say, virtuosity to it at times. Um, as the guitar settles back in here, um, I'll apologize in advance for the excessive tuning. It just, you don't want to hear a guitar any more out of tune than it has to be. So Haider Villalobos, um, his primary compositional style can be very dissonant, it can be very beautiful, but his style of composition is based primarily on shapes that are well known to guitarists and moving them around the neck and seeing how they sound. The technique is called planing, and that's the idea of taking a chord we all know, such as A major, for example, and then seeing what it sounds like if we go like this. We get some pretty cool chords, and those are chords that are pretty unique to the guitar, meaning we wouldn't necessarily sit down with a pencil and paper and go, I think I want these notes here. You would never think of that most of the time. So some of these chords that Villalobos uses in a lot of his pieces are very much unique to the instrument for that reason. This particular piece is a little closer to home. It's a little bit more tame. It's his prelude number one. Um, it's just very Brazilian. And if you can hear a little bit of cello in this piece, that's for good reason. Villalobos played cello um, in addition to guitar, although I believe guitar was his primary instrument. Um, his style can, it's very interesting. There's Sometimes you can hear some of his music, probably not this piece, and you can think, I really don't like that because of the abrasive, gritty style of some of his chords. For example, he'll have one piece which goes. And some of these chords can be very extremely clashing. But this piece is one that has very limited amounts of that. It's just very well known for its likability. Um, so that's your history lesson on Villalobos. This is prelude number one. Thank you. 
So this next composer, Augustine Barrios, he lived around the same time as Villalobos. In fact, they met each other. And Barrios was a little more secluded. He was not so much out there in the mainstream of what was going on in music. Uh, Villalobos was kind of out there playing a bit more, composing was a bit more well known. So apparently they met each other at some point, which is kind of interesting. Barrios's music is, has a little bit of some of the same idea of finding the next musical idea through shapes. But this first piece that I'm gonna play for you, Julia Florida, sort of defies all of that. And it's just a brilliant composition that I think almost supersedes the guitar. Um, it's a melody line that's one of my favorite things, a melody line that goes for a very long period of time. It doesn't die in five seconds or three seconds. Um, today's pop music, a lot of it is centered on quick little things where you can snap your fingers and go da da, and that's it. That's all you have. And you sing it again, and then you know the, how the song goes. And this line it kind of goes against all of that because it's, it goes on for a good 30 seconds. Um, but the line just has so much feeling and emotion. Um, Julia Florida, so Julia was Barrios' student at the time. Apparently, it was a young, beautiful girl who was a, a daughter of one of his close friends. And so he wrote this piece for Julia. Um, and then Florida means um, blossom. So he was basically, this is a piece celebrating how she was growing up, progressing, ideally becoming a, um, a, an accomplished musician. And so that's what the piece is named after. And then I'll play the piece right after that, which is his waltz um, number four, opus eight. And that uh, is one of my favorite pieces to play at home because my two little twin daughters, they're a year and a half now. When I play the opening, they both start going like this. And they look at me and they smile. And it's whenever I go like this. And they love that. They literally just every time they look up and they smile. And it's just it's my new favorite song for that reason. So um, Julia Florida and uh, Vaults Number 8 by Augustine Barrios.
Thank you very much. If you ever hear that piece on the radio, you'll probably never hear it the same. I can't hear that piece and not go like this. It's just, it's, it's funny how when you hear a piece of music and there's something, some kind of feeling attached to it or some experience, you never forget it. It's just funny how that is. Certain songs, every time I hear them, I always remember where I first heard it, where I first learned it, the practice room where I first opened up the music. It's, it's funny how music has that ability to attach itself to the people and places and um, I just love that. So I want to, real quickly, before we finish here, I'm going to thank Jay Marty Cope for inviting me here. It's really just a pleasure. Um, and I just love this new building. This room is just spectacular. I've really enjoyed playing. And again, really enjoyed playing for all of you. And don't take it for granted that you would come out tonight and, and listen to me play. I really appreciate that. I'm going to finish with a piece by Fernando Sor. Fernando Sor was another kind of heavy hitter classical composer for the guitar. Um, Fernando Sor not only played guitar obviously very well, he also composed a lot. And the reason for that is because he did a lot of teaching and students at that period didn't necessarily have a lot of music to learn. If you were in the 1800s and it was, you had 10 students, 30 students, what music do they play? Well, he's like, well, I'll solve that problem. I'm just gonna write. And so he wrote just hundreds and thousands of pieces. Um, just a lot of, I have to check the exact number. Sorry if anybody's, Wikipedia, and I don't know, but it is, it's thousands of pieces, and um, it's really all in the very romantic classical style, but it's just very distinct, distinctly his music. So this is a piece that he wrote. Um, of course, at the time, the, the major pop music of the time was opera, and so if, you know, nowadays, if you want to get some hits on YouTube, you need to do some covers of whatever, Ed Sheeran, you know, that's how you get views, right? You get, you attach yourself, you play versions of whatever's capture the attention of the public. So that was, that's not a new thing. Back in the old days, they would write pieces that sounded like opera in, a, in a, an attempt to get some of the opera fanatics to stop and give their music a lesson. So this is one of his pieces he did that. This is the variations on a theme of Soar, on a theme of Mozart. And this is Mozart's magic flute. You'll hear the little quote from it in the first variation. It's a theme in variations. Um, just a delightful little piece. Um, hope you enjoy. So again, thank you all for coming and uh, just wish you all a great week. Thank you.
Thank you very much. So I'm going to play another slower piece. This is um, a piece called Bersus. It's Lullaby by Leo Brower. Leo Brower is a Cuban composer. Um, for the longest time, um, he was living in Cuba, unable to come here. But in recent years, he's been able to travel here and hopefully realize the celebrity status he has among classical guitar players. Um, his music is beautiful. N not only does he play in a lot of different styles, he's written a lot of very atonal, very aggressive music and also minimalistic stuff. But this is one of his classics, it's called Bersus. This was one of the first pieces I worked on with my teacher when I was about um, 13, 14 years old. And I just have never stopped playing it, so I hope you enjoy it. Thank you all again for having me in. Hope you enjoy. Thank mm -hmm. you. 